light the first candle in honor of Islam. Christian, Jew, Muslim, shaman, Zoroastrian, stone, ground, mountain, river. Each has a secret way of being with the mystery, unique and not to be judged. We light the second candle in honor of Buddhism. There is no significant division between us and other people because our basic natures are all the same. If we wish to ensure everyone's peace and happiness, we need to cultivate a healthy respect for the diversity of our peoples and cultures founded on an understanding of this fundamental sameness of all human beings. We light the third candle in honor of Christianity. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong on the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make it any that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would there be a sense of smell? We light the fourth candle in honor of Judaism. The beauty of creation as we believe and as science ever more wondrously shows, is that unity above creates diversity below. And the more complex the life form, the greater the diversity. We light the fifth candle in honor of Hinduism. To see the unity in diversity is yoga. Union to see the same consciousness in everyone. Whoever realizes that union will always love the whole universe as part of his or her own self. We light the sixth candle in honor of Taoism. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, Everyone will respect you. We light the seventh candle in honor of Sikhism. There is but one breath. We are all identical in matter. And among all, the entire light is the same. The one light is contained among all the different and diverse things. Today's reading comes from Ernest Holmes. We are all individual entities in a universe which furnishes the background and the foreground for each of us, but each is unique, different, and yet fundamentally alike. Why then should it seem strange? If the whole differentiation of the physical universe is but a difference in form, distinguishing objects from one another because of the arrangement, that the enlightened should see back of this arrangement the word of God. If you could, please go into the silence with me for a moment. <coughs> I am so grateful for this blessed day and for this incredible time that we have together. I am knowing that this service is blessed 
and in divine right order. I'm knowing that Reverend C.C. is divinely guided and inspired. I'm knowing that the higher mind band is, is so infused with the spirit and the power and the presence within the music. And I'm knowing that the children in back are so blessed and having so much fun. I give thanks for this service. I give thanks that we have the opportunity in this moment, in this day, to choose such perfection, such blessing. And I say, thank you. And so it is. <coughs> So this April, we're exploring the idea of promoting diversity and inclusion. That in this annual progression that we're, we're making through these principles of, of basically the way to live on the planet. Uh, social justice, it's sometimes called. Um, individually and collectively, the question is whether our lives are aimed at reducing the polarization, the fragmentation of society that's happened because of race, religion, class, politics, gender, sexual orientation, national origin, all those things we set up as ways to divide ourselves from one another. Are we doing things to reduce that? Is that where our lives are aimed? And it's, so it's about asking in the words of our founder, Ernest Holmes, whether our lives are aimed at recognizing the essential oneness of humanity or not. In the last week we talked about what diversity is and that it simply is. It is simply a recognition and celebration of the fact that each one of us is unique. No one is exactly like everyone else. Everyone is different from each <coughs> other, but the differences make up the diversity of the, and the texture of the community. And we talked about the diversity that overlays the unity of all creation. You know, di diversity simply is. It is part and parcel of the way the universe works. Because without diversity, we never would have shown up on the planet, right? Everything would still be like one-celled, squishy things. And there wouldn't be anything beyond that. We wouldn't be here. I don't know whether they're squishy or not. They seem squishy. They seem squishy. Be behind the diversity, there is, however, this essential oneness, and we, we talked about that, and, and we say we believe that. We say we believe that, that, that life is unity, that there's only one life, and that life is God's life, right? We say that, but sometimes we have this mm, other theology that bubbles up, and says, no, not them. <laughs> they aren't part of this one that I am, right? Or, and, and we try to put them outside the circle. And, and people we don't like, people that we don't agree with, people that are different from, from us, we try to put them outside the circle. And, um, and I commented last week how dangerous that is. Because if we can put someone outside the circle, we can put ourselves outside the circle. And, and we've all spent a lot of time thinking we were outside the circle of this oneness and, um, and to, to waste any time thinking about going back there or putting someone else out there. But when we can, when we can recognize that outer diversity is an expression of the truth that there's something holding us all together, outer diversity is the... Is the perfect manifestation of this essential one, the one thing that is behind all things, that is the cause of all things, that one thing must include every single human being and every plant and every animal. And so we, we're there too, right? And, and I think at the same time it's recognizing that the diversity is the creative impulse of life itself in action. We're all one, but we are all uniquely ourselves. And so when we can recognize and celebrate and honor and welcome those differences, I think it's as important as remembering our essential unity. The differences are to be celebrated. It's one of those truly paradoxical things to 
recognize and see and honor and celebrate the difference and at the same time hold out onto that, hold to that essential unity is the balance, the, the paradoxical balance that we live in. Which is why it's not enough to say, as sadly some of my colleagues still do, well, I just teach that we're all one, can't we just move, move on? And no, we can't. Because what's that, what that has meant up till now is, you who are not like us, just learn to fit in. Become like us and everything will be fine. And that's not acceptance and honoring and celebration. We're only now coming to learn to appreciate and really see the beauty and value and to celebrate our differences, to work together, to build community together. You know, we strive to be a community of love where all people can experience transformational change. And we mean that, all people. Not just the people who look like me, right? Not just the people who think like we do. When we are able to build, meet and build relationships with people who are not like us, everybody has a chance to be transformed by the very differences we're thinking about. We, we, we learn to understand each other and to embrace more ways in which the one is expressing itself in our world. That's the whole idea behind what author Tracy Brown calls a stained glass community. A stained glass spirit community. I love that. She writes, a stained glass spirit community is one where each person is recognized as a unique expression of God and their individual strength and beauty become essential elements that contribute to a lively and inspiring collective experience. That's what our mission invites us to welcoming and honoring and celebrating all kinds of people is the necessary first step, right? It is. But in order to do that, we have to really be willing to see the ways we're unconditional or un unintentionally unwelcoming. We can be unintentionally unwelcoming by simply refusing to talk or think about diversity. And there are people who do that. There are people who don't, don't like to think about it. We can be unintentionally unwelcoming by refusing to change things up in our community to make it more welcoming to more people. We can refuse to do the work to find out how, our, how what we do and how our inter internal culture might be made more attractive and welcoming to more, to more kinds of people. And we can refuse to make those kinds of changes because they scare us. They're scary for some of us. We say we believe diversity is welcome, that we want greater diversity, that truly all people are welcome here, but when it comes right down to actually making a change, many of us say, but I don't want to change, right? We want change, but we don't want to make any change. I think people are like that in general. There's a really profound quote in Tracy Brown's little book, Stained Glass Spirit Community. She says, diversity is not the problem. It is the stories we tell ourselves about diversity that are the problem. What the stories are, what the stories we tell ourselves about people who are not like us, there are lots of them, right? Society tells us stories. You get a different story depending on which news channel you watch, but society has lots of reinforcement for the idea that different is somehow dangerous, that different is risky, that being around too many people who are not like us is, is not safe. And the problem with the story is the people we think might be dangerous usually aren't, and, they're, and we think they're dangerous because they don't look like us, or act like us, or think like us. And we miss the ones who actually might be dangerous to us because they look like we do. Right? There is a Muslim tax attorney, born in Detroit, lives in Alexandria, Virginia. His name is Atif Irfan. And he and several family members were flying from D.C. to Florida for a religious retreat. 
And he and his brothers were in their seats, and they were talking, as people do on planes, about which safe, safe, seats were safest on the airplane. You know, you've heard all that. The safest seat is way in the back, or the, safe, the safest seat is anywhere but over the wing, and all that stuff. They were just talking about it. And somebody heard them, misinterpreted them, misjudged them, reported them, and eventually the airline threw them off the plane and called the oh. FBI. Oh. They were quickly cleared by the FBI as definitely not terrorists, but Air Tran refused to fly them to Florida. It's unbelievable, the airline wouldn't do it. That kind of stuff happens more often than we know. You read about it a lot, you know? People call the police on black people for, for having a barbecue, or sleeping in the student lounge area, or waiting for a friend at Starbucks, or campaigning door to door, or helping a homeless person, or cashing their paycheck. Just two days ago, up the street at Meyer, a woman was assaulted for wearing a hijab trying to buy milk. Right? Shoved up against the, the cooler. But prior to walking into a church in Charleston and opening fire on a black group, a black community at a prayer meeting, Dylan Roof exhibited all kinds of crazy. Mm -hmm. Racist, mm -hmm. anti-Semitic, anti-social behavior. And what people did instead was reach out to him. There was a psychologist who offered him a quarter for every TED talk he watched online to broaden his horizons. People were kind to him. He was like them. Right? What I'm getting at are, is our fears around other people usually have no basis in reality. And, and really, reality on this plane, or, or spiritual reality, the, the reality is we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We are all embodiments of the One. The more we realize and recognize the One in each other, the more we welcome others into our lives, the richer we will all be. The better we know the one thing that is the cause of all things through its manifestations, the richer our lives will be. I read a wonderful story this morning from a uh, renowned millennial social scientist and theologian. Her name is uh, Christine Cleve, Christina Cleveland. She has, I don't know how many advanced degrees, and she happens to be black. And early in her career, she got a job at a small, very conservative Christian college. And there was a group of white, young white guys in her class that, that seemed um, to take great delight in challenging her in the classroom. Because they'd been taught, their, their conservative religion had taught them that she had no right to teach men. She was a woman. Right? So they, they would ask her questions in class that were designed to challenge her and undermine her authority. And her first response was, I have a PhD, you yahoos. And then she thought, I want to do this a different way. I want to do this a different way. So at home, she began to practice a meditation based on the Hindu teaching of Namaste. The light in me sees the light in you. She translated it into a little bit more Judeo-Christian framework. She would visualize her tormentors and say, the image of God in me greets the image of God in you. So back in class, whenever one of the boys would raise his hand, she would like shoot a Nerf arrow of love at him in her imagination. <laughs> and then she would pray this prayer, the image of God in me sees the image of God in you. And there was this little tiny space in there between the question, the rude question, and her response. And in that little tiny space, things kind of started to relax a little bit. Without any obvious cause, her self-appointed critics lost interest in the power game. It's those nerf arrows of love, they do it every time. They do. So by the end of the semester, she had a party for all of her students, a cookie-baking party. And these four guys showed up. And they were the ones who ran around assembling the ingredients and beat, it, beat the dough and shaped the cookies and served the fresh, you know, warm chocolate chip cookies to the other people. They were the last to leave that night. One of them wrote his final paper on 
women in ministry, and planned to open a conversation about gender reconciliation in his own church. See, her expression of spiritual generosity, which is what that is, it's fueled by, by her own inner struggle to put love over power, changed everything, shifted the whole landscape, changed these young men's minds in a big way. From power to holy tenderness. We cannot affect justice without love, she says. We cannot affect justice without love. So the bottom line is, if we're serious about being a community of love where all people are supported in their own transformation, if we're serious about consciously creating a world that works for everyone, if we're serious about living what it is we say we believe, we have to be willing to choose love over power, over privilege, over fear of difference. We cannot affect justice without love. And I think sometimes we hesitate to do that because we're afraid we'll make a mistake. We're afraid we'll say something stupid, we'll offend someone, we'll make a comment that makes somebody upset. Let me just say that if that's our motivation, we're more worried about ourselves than the other person. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't want to look foolish, right? We want to and should be respectful. But is it ever possible? Is it ever possible to know what to say and do in every circumstance? I submit to you it is not. It is not. And nobody expects that of us. Only we do. What is expected is that we're conscious. What is expected is that we're choosing love. What is expected that we're, is that we're respectful in our choice of language, language and behavior. We're conscious of the impact of our words and our body language, not just our intent. What might the impact be? I was at a workshop one time where the facilitator gave us all a learner's permit to do what we were doing. And she said, you know, think about when you were learning to drive a car. First you had a little instruction. You got some basic information so you could go out on the road and then you practiced. And then you practiced. You got some coaching from some really good drivers and you continued to practice. So the learner's permit gives us the comfort to kind of stretch outside our comfort zone, right? We get, we, get, we get permission to be a little messy, to be a little messy, to learn what to avoid, to pay attention to what we do, and then to take the action that will give us the feedback we need to get better. We have permission to practice. We have the permission to practice walking up to someone who isn't like us and getting to know them. If the motivation is love, the impact will probably be more loving than we, than we worry about. I think it's really valuable to give ourselves a learner's permit in this whole area of diversity and inclusion. It's valuable that we understand that the way to learn is to practice, right? It's valuable that we understand we will probably make mistakes and to ask forgiveness and to learn from the mistakes. I think it's a valuable attitude to say, I don't know what I'm going to move forward anyway. I have enough, language, enough information not to be dangerous, so I'm going to start practicing. And the same thing happens to all of us. It applies to all of us. We have to simply stay awake and aware and pay attention to our language, our choices, our behavior, and our impact. We have to be willing to sort of walk through a little messiness, right? With the intention of making ourselves more welcoming of diversity, individually and collectively. Whether it's you know, you don't hang out with kids because um, uh, you don't know what to say to teenagers. Try saying hello. <laughs> you know, start there and see what happens. You can say, you can actually say, because I, I do it all the time, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, I'm really uncomfortable because they don't know what to talk about. Let them talk. Let them talk. If someone's a different color from you, start by saying hello. If someone's a different 
sexual identity than you, start by saying hello. It doesn't matter how they're different. It's in getting to know people who are different than we are that we learn. And Booker T. Washington said, few are too young and none too old to make the attempt to learn. Amen. 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 So we're all learning all the time. Let's, let's, let's learn from one another. Let's learn together how to be that stained glass spirit community.